We are very pleased to uh, welcome Steve to our institute seminar today. Um, I will briefly introduce you, Steve, and then we are ready to start. Um, so, Steve uh, studied uh, theoretical physics at the University, um, Technical University of Freiburg. He holds a PhD in uh, solid state physics, which might explain his strong expertise in uh, uh, density function theory. And um, after his studies, he switched to IT industry for a couple of years doing uh, test automation, cloud storage. Death of things, and now he's uh, back on the academic track, uh, having been part of the Helmut's AI team uh, at HDR from the very beginning. And that's also where we met actually for the first time. So, glad to have you, Steve. And without further ado, uh, Steve, the floor is yours. All right. Um, so, thanks for the introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation also. Can you can you hear me right? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I, I plan to be on site, but uh, the common November cold got me again. Um, yeah, but let's see uh, how we make this work. So let me share my screen. Um, So, can you see these slides? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Can you see if I switch? I don't know if there's a lag, maybe? There's a lag on the big screen, but it works on the laptops. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there's a lag, but it's, it's well, it's, it's, it works, actually. Okay. Okay. So you should see the slide that says motivation, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. 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 All right. Um, so um, I will talk today about um, or give an introduction to uh, Gaussian uh, processes and uh, kernel methods. Really, just an introduction. And um, um, the reason I'm doing this is um, because I'm at the moment involved in a Helmut AI voucher. Uh, this is what we call our project uh, with Lenz and Attila and also Zoom um, um, in context of the MALA project. And there uh, the plan was to do a little bit of uncertainty quantification for neural networks. And um, a lot of the theory um, which is behind uncertainty quantification is actually, actually rooted in um, Bayesian statistics. And this is also the uh, basic theory behind Gaussian processes. And there are some interesting connections to uh, kernel methods. And um, this is why I, I thought I'd maybe share some of these uh, really basic uh, insights with you. Um, so all of the stuff I'm talking about today is more or less textbook stuff. So there's nothing new, new research, at least not from, from my side. Um, but I think it's good to uh, disseminate these kinds of uh, theoretical foundations and the connections to neural networks and to everybody working, especially in um, uncertainty quantification. So un uncertainty quantification is um, a field of uh, neural network research, which is pretty important and uh, uh, is performed by a lot of people right now. Um, and many people try to adopt these kinds of methods in their applications, be it uh, safety critical things like driving health. Active learning uh, is an interesting application, um, but also things like, which are not related to neural networks actually, like Bayesian optimization. Uh, for very costly uh, objective functions and even things like out of distribution detection and things like that. Um, okay, so we'll start since this is an introduction with a um, with some preliminary uh, basic textbook stuff 
Um, the first is the um, multivariate uh, normal distribution, or in general, a, the idea of a multivariate uh, probability distribution, uh, which is here is a in the picture above a two-dimensional uh, Gaussian distribution, um, where we have a mean, which is characterized by the mean vector mu and a covariance matrix sigma, um, which um, basically describes the shape of this distribution. And this is uh, something we will use um, in this in this talk. Um, so to set up some notation that we will use in this talk, um, we will talk a lot about linear models, which is about the simplest form of a machine learning model that you can find, um, which is just a sum of inputs um, weighted by some um, weights that we fit when we fit the model to the to the data. Um, and the notation that we use here um, is because we need this distinction, um, the model output we will denote with a little hat over, over Y and the our data points or labels or targets which may contain noise, we will denote as Y without the hat. So that's just a notational thing. Um, and we will only talk about uh, models which um, of the form where they map um, a vector in RD to a scalar R. And this is the theory behind uh, kernel methods and Gaussian processes is only for those models. Um, I will talk about extensions of this later on. Um, and also for the sake of notation, we will use uh, what's called a design matrix where we put all our input points X as rows in a matrix of shape uh, N, which is where N is the number of training data points that we have and D is the dimension. Okay, that's just some notation. Um, okay, so the first thing we can do with linear models um, to make them actually um, into non, to fit uh, nonlinear uh, relationships in data is uh, what's called a feature space mapping or the usage of basis functions where we replace the input vector x by a mapping phi of x. Um, and by that, we are able to uh, still use all the theory behind linear models, but we can fit uh, models which are nonlinear in x. An example is here for a, a finite dimensional feature mapping where we have a, where our input is two dimensional. So think of a function of two variables um, where you have like a landscape, let's say, um, as your data. <clears throat> and then we, we, we map this to a higher dimensional space, in this case, uh, fifth dimensional. Um, and by that, uh, we can, for example, construct uh, polynomial models. Um, this is in, in the scikit-learn library that you may know. Um, there's even a, a functionality called polynomial features, and this is their way to uh, to fit uh, polynomials. So that's this idea of a feature mapping to um, map inputs into a higher dimensional space where we may be able to work with them in an easier fashion. Okay, so the first thing which will lead us a little bit into kernel methods is this notion of a kernel function. So a kernel function in um, very um, non-rigorous um, mathematical definition is a function of two inputs, uh, which is symmetric and which is always positive. And you can think of this uh, kernel function and or we will use it um, as a similarity measure between two of our input points. For example, um, at the bottom here, you see the our running example that we will use in this talk, and which is also the most widely used uh, kernel function, which is called the Gaussian or radial basis function or squared exponential kernel, which has a single free parameter, the length scale F, uh, L, which is, if you think of a Gaussian, which is the sigma, so it's the, the standard deviation. So it's basically the, the width 
of the function, if you will. And uh, this kernel measures the similarity between two input points. And for if the two input points are equal, then this function is one, and else it's smaller than one. And we can also um, uh, connect these ideas of a kernel to our uh, to these feature mappings where we can write the kernel function as an inner product in this feature space. There's a rich theory behind this, which we will not cover in this introduction, which is connected to a thing called reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, where um, we, we basically find that um, uh, we, we cannot always ex explicitly define these feature mappings, but it's uh, enough to define or to find a kernel function which has the properties that we, we want and we, we will only work with this kernel function as a similarity measure and can thereby implicitly work in these high dimensional spaces without writing down these um, feature mappings explicitly. So this is the idea of a kernel very briefly. Um, okay. And now this is a pretty busy uh, slide. I will walk you through all of the all of the things that we that we see here. So now um, we encounter our first uh, building block that we need to understand a Gaussian process. Okay. So uh, in the theory of Gaussian processes and <clears throat> In general, in, in, in Bayesian statistics, we always work with probability distributions. And we will encounter in this talk several probability distributions. And the first probability distribution that we encounter here is what you see on the upper right, uh, which is called a weight prior. So remember our linear model, um, which is which is given here um, in, in this in the middle here in this uh, in this green green color um, we have our weight uh, vector multiplied by our feature map x um, and we now assume that we do not have one weight vector but we actually have a probability distribution over these vectors which is called this weight prior and this is taken to be a gaussian with some covariance matrix and now because our the weights of our model are random, so follow a probability distribution, it follows that the output of the model is also a probability distribution. So, uh, and this means, which is also the main idea behind a Gaussian process, a Gaussian process is uh, like any other statistical process, it is a mathematical structure where if you draw samples from it, you get a function. So it is a, a Gaussian process is a thing where you can think of it as a probability distribution over functions because every weight vector um, is connected to a specific model function. So if we draw a sample from this distribution, we get a function. Okay, and this is what we see here on the left. The these these green curves are different samples drawn from this prior distribution over model functions. In this case, these are 10 uh, samples. And if we take a, an infinite number of samples and we average them, uh, we get this red line, which is the mean, which is here uh, in the simplest case, because the weight prior has zero mean, the, the mean of our uh, average over model functions drawn samples is also zero. And we have the covariance matrix K, um, which uh, happens to be also a kernel. And this covariance function measures or tells us in some sense how similar, as I said, it's, um, it is a similarity measure, how similar are two neighboring points. And by using um, a covariance function like the uh, squared exponential that I showed you earlier, we get these uh, smooth functions because nearby points are more similar than points far away. So they are more, more correlated. Nearby points are more correlated than points that are far away, and which gives us these uh, smooth curves. 
Okay, so this is what's called the the GP prior. Okay, so it's just a probability distribution over functions which with a zero mean, nothing too fancy yet. Um, the next ingredient on our way to a Gordon process is what's called a likelihood. <coughs> um, and this is the following thing. We have again our linear model. And you remember maybe that in the beginning I said that we have this distinction between the model output, this y hat, and our given uh, training data y. And we assume here in the likelihood that um, our data, our training data that we get, contains some noise, and that the noise is distributed again with a Gaussian distribution around the model. So we treat our model function as the underlying data generating process that we want to find by fitting uh, the model. And we assume that the data is, the noise in the data is distributed um, as a Gaussian uh, with zero mean and the variance uh, sigma squared. And we will treat uh, in this talk the um, the noise as a constant, meaning it is a hyperparameter. And we will use this uh, later on. So we have this uh, notation of the likelihood where we write uh, p of y, it, which means that our training data or measurement data, where measurement device is actually a probability distribution over uh, over data. And the mean is given by our model function. And on the left-hand side, you see this written out for uh, for a single input point, so for a single x and for one scalar y. And on the on the right, uh, just for uh, the sake of uh, completeness, um, you see this written out for um, for a collection of points in a vectorized fashion, where we have a product of these. Um, individual likelihoods um, and the product is uh, because we just multiply um, the likelihood of each point uh, and we, we can do this because they are the the noise is assumed to be independent for individual points which means the noise is not correlated from one input point to the next okay so that is the likelihood and um, maybe um, you notice that the likelihood is written as a probability distribution over y. So, and if you remember maybe from stats that um, every probability distribution has to integrate to one. So if we integrate over the probability distribution with respect to y, um, it has to uh, integrate to one, but a likelihood is, um, when we use the same function, but we don't treat it as a, probability distribution, but we treat it as a function of the weights w. And in this case, integration over the weights doesn't need to be, doesn't need to integrate to uh, one, because if we use it as a function of, of w, it's not a probability distribution. That's just a, a notational or a, a thing of interpretation that we will use later in, in base rule. So, the important thing to remember here is that the likelihood models our assumption about the noise in the data with respect to our model, and um, it contains our model itself. Okay, um, and now we come to uh, really the, the heart of uh, Bayesian statistics, um, where we, um, combine the things that we encountered earlier, and this is called Bayes' rule. And it's a rule about really um, conditional uh, probability distributions. So I will walk you through the individual terms. <laughs> so you see here um, in this expression the, the likelihood that we just saw, and this likelihood basically contains uh, our noise model, our assumption about how the noise is distributed uh, in our data, and it contains our model itself. It also contains the weight prior, so our prior assumptions about uh, the distribution of 
uh, the weights of our model. Then there's a normalization constant, uh, the marginal likelihood, which we will ignore for now, treat it as a constant for now. Um, and by applying this formula, uh, which is called Bayesian inference, <coughs> what we get is we get a posterior distribution over our model weights. And the interpretation of this is um, by using training data, the capital X and the lowercase y, we transform our prior uh, over the weights. So our prior assumptions about how the weights of our model might be distributed, we transform this into another probability distribution over model weights, which is now informed by seeing some data. I know this is pretty abstract. We will, in the next slides, uh, I think it will become more clear. Um, so this is the basic idea behind Bayesian inference. We go from a prior probability distribution over model weights to a posterior probability distribution over model weights or the weight posterior. Um, which has which which contains um, the information um, taken from the training data. Okay, um, yeah, it will become more clear in the next slides. I think there's a more compact notation that you see in 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 books and papers where we um, write the the data x and y as a data set capital D, which makes the notation a little bit more more compact. Okay, so the final bit of uh, tedious uh, math uh, before we get to see some re results. So what we have done so far, maybe if I go back, we have, um, I can even highlight, we have obtained um, by applying Bayes rule, we have obtained this weight posterior. And so we now have a probability distribution over over model weights um, that contains information gained uh, or extracted from the training data. And now to make a prediction using this distribution, we need another, and this will be the final probability distribution that we encounter, um, is called the predictive posterior distribution. And we arrive at this distribution, so this is this guy here, we arrive at this distribution by what's called Bayesian model averaging. So the e equations look a bit tedious, but what it what it really is, is um, you have a function of your weights, which is the likelihood. So the weights here. Um, and you, you do an average by integrating uh, this function over all the weights and the weight factor is this posterior distribution over W that we just uh, got from base rule. And this gives us um, a probability distribution now over model outputs. So this thing here, which is again um, a Gaussian distribution. And this crucially has a mean value and a covariance matrix. So after all these math and uh, integrals and probability distributions, what we get is the equations here, which are the most important ones and the only ones that we will use in the in the following. We get an expression for mu for the for the predictive mean, uh, which is just this thing here. And um, the most important thing to remember, uh, we will see this in the following slides, is this pinkish expression here. Namely, that um, we have the matrix K, which contains um, all the kernel values, remember all the similarity values uh, in our kernel matrix, plus the, um, the data noise that for now we will assume is a hyperparameter, is a constant. Uh, and we call this alpha. So the end result of all this math is basically just that the prediction of a Gaussian process is a sum of similarity measures between input points weighted by some weights alpha that we can calculate um, as shown here. And the intuition behind it 
is um, that when you imagine that you have this similarity function or kernel function kappa, which is a, a little Gaussian shaped function, you place this function over every training point. And then if you do the sum, you basically say that um, points which are near to a point that I where I evaluate the model on contribute more to the prediction than, than points that are far away. So this is the basic um, intuition uh, that you can read into this equation here. And again, the weights alpha uh, can be computed like shown here. Okay. So now we, we will apply this to some data in this example here. So remember uh, from the beginning, we had this distribution, this prior distribution over model functions, which had a mean of zero and they basically were all over the place. And now by applying Bayes rule and doing all this math and applying the equations, the final equations that I showed you uh, on the on the previous slide, which I have again uh, listed here on the right. Um, we have now a probability distribution again over uh, model outputs, which is this green Y hat, and, and which is signified here by these, by these green curves. And what we find is um, that if in this case, this, uh, this sigma, this noise value is for now zero. Um, and if we draw now samples from this posterior, uh, this pr predictive posterior distribution, what we find is that all the sampled functions go through the data points exactly, and be between the data points, they vary. Um, and we can use the um, expression for the covariance matrix to uh, compute a variance at every x point that we want. And this is our uncertainty information. Okay. And you see these kinds of pictures you see in basically every, every GP uh, textbook. So this is all, as I said, really nothing new. Um, so what you can think of, what we're doing here is we take these functions from the prior and by introducing training data, we constrain this distribution such that all the sampled functions now have to go through the points exactly. Okay, now we do just one change. We allow the noise in the data, this sigma n squared, we allow this to be greater than zero. Um, so the only change that we made is that now this guy here is non-zero. And if we now draw again samples from this distribution, um, we see that the mean does not go through the points exactly. So what this means is that by introducing an assumed noise in the data, we went from interpolation, zero noise, or in machine learning terms, zero training loss, if you will, we went from interpolation to regression, where we have a non-zero training loss, if you will. So this is a very, very useful concept um, to this distinguish regression and interpolation by switching on and off the assumed noise in the data. Okay, this is really the main key point here to un understand. And again, always we have that the, the uh, equation for the mean, for the predictive mean, which is the model or the, the GP output really, is just the sum over, <coughs> over the covariance. So the similarity measure times the weights. And you see here that this noise, this assumed noise in the data um, only shows up in the equation for the weights. So by adjusting the weights, we adjust uh, whether or not the mean goes through the points exactly or not. Okay, uh, final, I said final, there was uh, 
a little bit of a lie. This is really, I think, the the final math slide. I will just go quickly over it. Um, so you have noticed um, that we 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 have talked about this uh, sigma, so this hyperparameter, the noise. But what we haven't talked about is um, what I've hidden here in this in this plot at the at the top. This L. Um, this uh, this L uh, length scale parameter of the kernel, which we for now also uh, have not talked about, and this is a second hyperparameter. The this this L value, which I said defines basically the width of this of, of this function, um, has to be um, determined somehow. And it turns out that we can do this in in a in the Gaussian process. Um, there is uh, we can get if all the uh, distributions involved are are Gaussian. Um, we can derive an analytic expression um, by using the uh, the marginal likelihood. This was in the in, in base rule this the, this normalization constant which we ignored before, um, which is again an integral over our uh, our likelihood times the prior where we integrate out all the model weights but we have an implicit dependence uh, of this expression on the hyperparameters namely the noise in the likelihood and the length scale of the kernel in this in the case where we use the squared exponential kernel there are lots of other kernels which have more parameters but uh, in this example that we have here, we only have a kernel with one parameter, and then we have this likelihood noise. So we have two hyperparameters, and we can, as I said, in this case here, we can write down a analytic ex expression um, for this um, marginal likelihood. And for computational reasons, uh, people often use uh, the logarithm of that because then um, all the exponentials turn into sums, um, and this is really an analytical function that you can minimize with respect to these two parameters. Okay, so we have in the Gaussian process we have a way to uh, calculate our fit weights, so these alphas, and we have a way um, which falls out of the theory to do hyperparameter optimization, which is with a well-defined objective function. Um, here is an example of this objective function um, where we now use the, the negative to turn this um, into a minimization problem, um, which is shown here on the left. And you see that in this example, uh, you can have uh, sometimes not only one, but two or more uh, minima, which means assuming that these minima have the same depth, um, which I'm not sure this is the case in this example here, which I took from, by the way, this very, very nice book from uh, Kevin Kevin Murphy, which I really highly recommend. Um, which me this means that we have in this case we have two optima in this um, optimization landscape, so we have two values for the length scale of the kernel and for this noise variable, um, which can be interpreted as we can explain the data in two different ways with two different models. One model which has um, a short length scale, so it's a very flexible model, if you will, and low noise, but we can also explain the same data with a long length scale, which basically makes our function stiff or has or with lo having low curvature and large noise. So there are, uh, in this example here, two ways to explain the data. Uh, but the good thing about this um, marginal likelihood approach to hyperparameter optimization is that um, the number of parameters that you have is really small. So you have kernels with maybe two or three parameters. So in contrast to using your neural network, that's where you have um, or to training neural networks. Um, here you have a function which where you have for your fit weights an analytical expression and for the hyperparameter optimization you have a function um, which you can analyze, for example, just by plotting it, because uh, in this case only two parameters, which is pretty nice. Um, 
okay, I have to speed up, I think, a little bit. So this was um, Gaussian processes, really, in a nutshell. And in an even more nutshell, um, I will quickly introduce a kernel rich regression, which um, I will show in the next slide. Is, um, uh, the end result is very, very similar, or in fact, same as Gaussian process, but the derivation and the theory behind it is completely different, completely different. There are no probability distributions whatsoever. Um, the theory behind it is um, you have a, you start with a regularized loss, in this case, a squared loss written here as a functional, so a loss functional over some function space. And there's a nice theorem called the representer theorem, which says that a loss of this form always has the solution. So the function that minimizes this loss uh, of this form here. And this should look pretty much very familiar. It is a sum over a similarity measure between points weighted by this alpha. So this is the exact same uh, expression that we saw in the Gaussian process for the posterior predictive uh, distribution for the mean of it. Um, and we can write um, this loss uh, in terms of this weights alpha. And what we get is the exact same expression for these for these alpha, for these weights. Um, and maybe you recognize this parameter lambda here. Um, in the Gaussian process, this was our noise. So, and we will compare on the next slide a little bit more these things. So we have completely different theory, um, but we have in the end, if we use the same kernel, which we can, um, if we use the squared exponential kernel, we have also two hyperparameters, namely the length scale of the kernel and this regularization parameter. Um, so, and hyperparameter optimization in kernel rich regression, which you can treat as any model having hyperparameters, so it doesn't have to be kernel rich regression, but we will apply this to kernel rich regression, is um, we don't have a um, some mathematical formalism to derive a objective function that we can optimize with respect to the hyperparameters. We have to use uh, statistical methods, for example, uh, cross-validation. So this is a typical method um, that people use. I have stolen this uh, this image here from the scikit-learn documentation, which is really good and which I highly recommend. So what you do in a nutshell, in case you're not familiar with cross-validation, is you take your training data, you split it up, in this case, into uh, into five what's called folds, so five chunks, and then five times you train your model on uh, the concatenation of four of them, and you evaluate the model on the on the fifth. So you calculate your loss on the fifth and report it, and then the um, the performance of the model is the average um, of the, if you will, test losses um, over these five poles. And you do this for, you can evaluate this function as a function <coughs> of the hyperparameters, and by that construct an optimization. Um, objective. So in comparison, GPs and kernel rich regression, so both have the same expression for the model output, which is a sum over a similarity measure between input points and uh, training points, weighted by some weights that we can calculate uh, in closed form. And we have hyperparameters where if we use the squared exponential kernel, we have only one hyperparameter, which is this L, this length scale. And we have this uh, second hyperparameter, um, which in the Gaussian process is the assumed noise. And in kernel rate regression, it is a, um, you call it a regularization parameter, but what you see here is that the effect is the exactly, is exactly the, the, the same. Um, on the weights, which means that assuming noise in your data is the same as applying regularization in a non-Bayesian setting. And this is really the key message that I want to communicate here, that these views of assuming noise and re uh, regularization result in the same 
uh, predictive um, model. So this is really the key message here. And again, we have in the GP, we have um, an uncertainty information, which we do not have in KRR. There just is no theory for uncertainty. And uh, in the GP, we have a objective function um, that we can minimize for the for the hyperparameters um, that falls out of the theory, while in KRR, we have to use um, something like cross realization um, And to compare these two methods on some toy data, um, what I what I show you here is generated toy data, these, these gray points. Um, and I fit these two models, now this time with hyperparameter optimization. And we see that, um, so the KRR is the red curve, GP is the green one. Um, we see that, first of all, the models uh, in the region where we have data, they are pretty close, but they are not the same. And that with the GP, which is this uh, greenish area, we get some uncertainty information, which is pretty nice because the model can tell us that I'm pretty uncertain to make predictions in regions where I did not see data. So this is the left and right regions where we just have no data. And in the middle where I have created a gap in the data, the uncertainty is high. And you can get this information from a Gordon process and in KRR, there just isn't an equivalent. Now, the question is, I said earlier, um, the equations for the weights are the same. Um, we have these hyperparameters, which can be attributed uh, to have the same effect. So why are these two functions, why they aren't, why they are, why aren't they uh, equal? Well, the reason is that um, the objective function for hyperparameter optimization in the GP, which is this log marginal likelihood, just isn't the same as um, cross validation. So if we look at these two functions, so these are co contour plots of these two objective functions for hyperparameter optimization. Uh, you have on the x-axis, you have this length scale parameter. And on the y-axis, you have um, in the GP case, this, uh, this noise, and in the KRR case, this uh, regularization parameter, which is the exact same thing. Um, and so for, for every point on the surface, what you do is you fix the values of these two parameters and you solve this linear system that I showed you for the weights. So you fit the model with the fixed setting of hyperparameters and you do this for all combinations of hyperparameters and then you get uh, a plot like this. And what you see immediately there is for both, there is a global minimum, which is marked with this, um, with this uh, white circle, but clearly these functions are not the same. They are similar. So the, 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 the global minimas are not too different, but they're not the, not the same. There is some theory. So I found one paper where they set, where they connected this log marginal likelihood to a very, very specific form of um, cross-validation, but which is computationally so, so costly that in practice, nobody does it. So this is done with five-fold cross-validation and it's just not the same. And this is the reason why you, you get these differences. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time, I think I will skip these code examples. So these are code examples um, for doing GPs in scikit-learn <coughs> and doing a kernel rich regression in scikit-learn. Maybe the the only um, thing that I want to note here in case people try, try this out, you have in scikit-learn, you have this thing called a Gaussian process regressor, um, which is, in, if you know scikit-learn, it adheres to the um, estimator a API and all that. And if you call gp.fit with your training data, what it does is it will do this hyperparameter optimization in the background, okay? So this is something to be aware of. While um, if you do KRR, kernel regression with S sklearn, you can also con construct a, a um, estimator. And if you call fit, it does not do hyperparameter optimization for you. So it, it, it solves the linear system for the weights only once and you have to do your own, you basically have to code your own um, hyperparameter optimization using cross-validation. And this is just an example here. Um, uh, what I want to do in the remaining uh, minutes, um, 
I want to show you so what we can do with these really these ideas of the theory um, behind GPs besides fitting GPs or kernel regression to, to some data. And uh, this is also the second point that I really wanted to communicate, this idea of having not um, one weight vector that you acquire by, for example, fitting a new network to your data, but having a distribution over weights, which means if the, your model structure is fixed, like think of the architecture of your neural network is fixed. Um, so the functional form of your model is fixed and you have multiple sets of weights. So the weights and, bi uh, weights and the, the biases, um, which I uh, um, uh, collect here in this uh, lowercase w. Um, so this idea of having a probability distribution over models and with this over weights is a, is a, is a, is a very powerful idea and we can use it also outside of GPs to do uncertainty estimation by in some way trying to approximate um, a probability distribution over, over weight. Um, and in your networks, uh, the way to do uncertainty, uh, the most simple, quite uh, computationally costly, but the most simple way is instead of <clears throat> training one neural network, you just use, this is really a super pragmatic thing. You use different random initializations and you treat, uh, you train five or 10 or 15 or 20, how many you want or how many you can afford networks. Uh, this is shown here at the top. These gray bushy curves are each, the prediction of a new network fitted, um, uh, stopped at the same train loss, uh, sorry, stopped at, at the same test loss um, to the same data. And we see that within the data, they all pretty much um, um, provide the same pr prediction, but uh, outside the, the data region, they diverge. And if we now take um, the, the sample variants of, of this, we get uncertainty information, right? So this is a very simple example of um, approximating this probability distribution over weights, where the idea is that if you think of your loss landscape, that by training a new neural network, you end up in different places of your loss landscape um, with a model which has the same performance, but different weights. And these models uh, give you different uh, predictions in regions where you, where you did not see data. Um, a pretty similar, but more uh, mathematically uh, uh, a approach with more mathematical background um, is called the Laplace approximation, where the idea is um, to treat it as a, um, a post-processing step after neural network training. Um, so you do the neural network training, which you can view as a map, which is called a maximum a posteriori. Um, estimate, which means you have your probability distribution over weights from base rule, if you had it. And if you take just, if you don't do an average over this distribution, but you just take the maximum, you just take uh, the weight vector, which, which has the highest probability. This is called a map estimate. And one can show that uh, if you train a new neural network, you can view uh, the training of a new network is to doing just that. And then uh, you look at your lost landscape and then you can um, approximate the lost landscape in the in um, in the neighborhood of your minimum in the in the lost landscape, approximate it uh, to second order with the Taylor expansion. Uh, and it turns out that you can write this as a Gordon distribution over model parameters with the where the Covariance matrix is connected to the to the inverse of the of the Hessian, so which this describes the, the local curvature, if you will. So what this means is you can construct in this way also a approximate probability distribution uh, over model functions, and since you have a distribution now you can um, you can um, extract uncertainty information. 
from it, which is shown in the in the plot at the top. And if we apply this to the same data that we have seen before, um, there's by the way this um, this paper here where they explain this method. They also have a pretty nice um, implementation for this in in PyTorch, which I recommend. Um, if you use this, then you get basically a picture similar to ensembles, but um, with some approximations to the Hessian because uh, it can get quite big. Um, you can get pretty pretty quick um, uncertainty estimates that way. Um, yeah, you can also do, uh, I will skip this loss landscape analysis. Um, no. um, maybe uh, to finish, um, some other relations uh, of this idea of Gordon processes uh, to neural networks or more general different connections between uh, GPs, kernels, and neural new networks. Um, there are many. Um, there is uh, one that I find pretty in interesting, um, which is called deep kernel learning. Where the idea is okay, we, we have these um, these kernels, these similarity measures, but we only have a limited number of hyperparameters to describe their shape. Maybe they are not too expressive. And the idea is to use instead of the simple analytical expressions, use neural networks as kernels um, to learn by doing this hyperparameter optimization. You learn or you 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 learn a the weights of a neural network which allows the kernel to express more structure in your data. And then you still in the back or the uh, GP theory to, to do the rest. So you just replace the kernel by a uh, neural network, by a new, new network of some kind or parts of the kernel as a neural network. Then there are other um, relations between GPs and uh, neural networks that you may have heard of this NNGP or the NTK, the neural tangent kernel. Uh, which involve these um, infinite width limits. So there are a number of papers um, explaining how a new network in the limit of infinite layer width um, can be connected to um, Gaussian processes and kernel methods, which you can use to analyze, for example, in the case of NTK, the training dynamics of new networks. Software, um, yeah. So there is, of course, scikit-learn, um, which is a, so it's not, you cannot use it for really big data sets. It's more a, a proof of concept or um, reference Im implementation. The implementation that I would recommend, even though the API is pretty complex, is gpytorch. So this is everything you find in recent papers about, not everything, but a lot of, approximate methods that um, are published for Gaussian processes um, are implemented there. Um, there are some other um, packages like GPy. TinyGP is pretty nice because it uses JAX and I really like JAX. Um, but it's a pretty small code, um, so you can play, play around with it. But for pr production and using very um, advanced features, I would recommend GPyTorch. Um, some things that I left out deliberately is there is this notion of a mean function in a Gaussian process. Um, so far, we, we um, assumed that the prior mean is um, zero. Um, but you can also, in some codes, allow this model a mean in your data explicitly. If you don't do it, then you have to um, scale your data before to zero mean, otherwise uh, you will get problems. Um, so in contrast to uh, normal linear models, um, GPs and KRR are what's called non-parametric models. So actually the this kernel matrix and uh, is n by n. So it grows with the number of your data and the, the number of weights that you fit is also the, the number of data points. So you will quickly get in trouble for very large data sets. And there are tons of approximate methods, which, um, for example, exploit the structure and the kernel matrix and similar things, um, which is all uh, documented in PyTorch. So I recommend to check out their documentation. Um, 
also, as I mentioned in the beginning, GPs and uh, KRR, uh, the theory is only for um, functions which produce a scalar output. There are so-called multi-output GPs, um, <coughs> which um, use some approximate methods to model the correlation between um, outputs of a vector um, shape. <coughs> so you can do that. Um, yeah, some resources, and then this is my final slide. I really recommend the 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 GP reference book, uh, Rasmussen and Williams, 2006. Uh, it's a free PDF. It's really it's the GP reference book. Then <coughs> there are two also free books from Kevin Murphy um, about everything machine learning with a <coughs> with a slight focus on probabilistic things, but it, he also covers new, new, new networks and everything. Um, then I have a little uh, repo at, on, on GitHub where I have some example codes for GPs and KR, um, yeah, and some papers um, Yeah, that I think the slides will be available, then you can check them out. So uh, with that, I am finished and I'm open for questions.